All right, welcome everybody to the Ignition Community Live. Uh, today's episode of the Ignition Community Live um, is going to be right here on the next slide, uh, which is episode 27, Ignition Edge at the I.O. level. And uh, we're excited for this one. Um, you have me as your host, Kent Melville, Sales Engineering Manager here at Inductive Automation. Um, and uh, I'm just really here to introduce the, the big guns, which is um, going to be some people from Opto22 who will be presenting today. But uh, I wanted to give a little background for those who may not be aware. Um, you know, these days, a lot of companies are looking for faster, easier ways to, you know, tackle digital transformation. And so we've created the Ignition Onboard program to help them with that. And so we partner with trusted hard hardware providers so that we can offer devices that have Ignition or Ignition Edge already installed and configured. So today we'll be talking about Ignition Edge Onboard specifically. And uh, Ignition Onboard devices are a great choice because they let you skip the install and save time. Um, for example, they're plug, plug and play. They're IIoT ready with MQTT to instantly publish your industrial data. Uh, they run uh, all through a rigorous uh, benchmarking process for incomparable performance. Uh, they're optimized by the manufacturer, and we test them here at Inductive Automation. So one of those onboard partners is Opto22, and they were one of the original ones from the beginning. And Opto22 has been in business for over 40 years. They manufacture reliable, easy-to-use hardware and software products for industrial automation, energy management, remote monitoring, and data acquisition. And they are known for their policy of providing free product support, free training, and free pre-sales engineering assistance. Uh, recently, uh, Opto22 released Groove Epic, which stands for Edge Programmable Industrial Controller, uh, and that has Ignition Edge on board. And Groove Epic is a new kind of industrial controller that simplifies, secures, reduces the cost of automation and IIoT products. Um, but now Opto22 has taken the next step to connect you to the source of operational data uh, with uh, Ignition Edge powered Ethernet IO modules uh, named Groove Rio. Uh, and you'll hear more about that soon. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll introduce the team here um, we're proud to work with Opto22, and so you'll be hearing from three of their members today. Um, the first is uh, Benson Hoagland, uh, Opto22's Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy. Uh, also, you'll have Ben Orchard and Garrick Reichert, who are both senior application engineers. Um, Benson, Ben, and Garrick, thanks so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you now to introduce yourselves and start your presentation. Fantastic. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Thank you for that introduction, Kent, and uh, thank you, David, and the rest of the team at uh, Inductive Automation for uh, this opportunity to uh, share these uh, exciting technologies uh, all working together. I am uh, presenting live from the Opto Demo Studios here in Temecula, California, so uh, let me give you a quick look at uh, what that looks like. Here's, the, uh, here's our headquarters about an hour north of San Diego. Uh, it's where we design, develop, manufacture, sell, and support everything we make. So made in the USA all the way. Let's dig right in. This is the agenda. These are the topics that we're going to cover uh, today. And just to be clear, we're, we're taking this a little bit more casually. So uh, we absolutely invite your questions uh, during the webinar. So I'm going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to have a lot of cool live demos and so on. But Garrick and, uh, and Ben are on standby ready to answer your questions as they start rolling in. So we'll answer those in real time, but we'll also have a Q&A session uh, after the live demo. But before we get to there, the first thing is go over a couple of real quick uh, ideas relative to IIoT, the goals and the technologies and so on. Then I'll give you a brief introduction about what Groove Rio is, uh, and then we'll take a look at what some of those system architectures might look like, those architectures where uh, Groove Rio is a terrific fit in combination with the Ignition 8 on there. The best part, of course, is always the live demo uh, from this studio. I've got some interesting stuff going on here. Uh, behind me, I've got a bunch of demo equipment, including some third-party PLCs. Uh, an Epic, of course, which is not for this uh, webinar, but we have other webinars for that. And a Rio over here running Ignition Edge. I've also got my little cooking cam here. So this is kind of neat. I've got my learning center, a uh, little Rio learning center with some IO outfitted on it, connected to a network and an Allen Bradley PLC, a little compact logics. That's kind of cool. And finally, down here to on the ground uh, to, my, to my right 
is an actual customer enclosure. This is for an oil and gas application where Rio is inside and it'll be running a ignition edge and talking to a pump off controller, but also the IO on the Rio will communicate to other devices, other sensors, level sensors, temperatures, and so on, pulling all that data in and then burping it out over a cellular network, all 100% secure, all 100% uh, with um, yeah, outbound communications and so on. So let's uh, let's keep moving here. Got lots to cover, but as I said, please pile in your questions, and we'll get to more of those on on the end. All right. So first, let's talk about some goals and technologies. Uh, ideally, uh, in an I I I O T transformation project, digital transformation, industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. But there's there's a, a number of goals there that we're trying to do. The first is to democratize operational data. Well, what does that mean? He says, well, there's a lot of operational data that's essentially locked in silos uh, throughout the plant floor, remote assets, or whatever. So a big part of IIoT from a goal perspective is how do we democratize that? How do we get the data out of these systems and into systems that can benefit from them? Could be business systems, could be other OT systems like SCADA, could be historians, business apps, whatever. The idea is to democratize this operational data. The second, and this doesn't get spoken about as enough, in my opinion, as much as it should, it is the a perfect time to address cybersecurity, uh, to be able to implement cybersecurity measures uh, as part of the digital transformation experience. Uh, and that allows us, you know, today we know uh, JBS, Colonial, the list goes on and on. There's cyber uh, incidents happening all the time. Now is the opportunity to address those. But of course, all those things don't matter the, as much as you know achieving the desired business outcome, whether that's to make a better product, improve quality, reduce downtime, provide a safer working environment, trying to achieve maybe new revenue streams, whatever it is, the business goals are what is, is the primary goal. And then some of these others are a way of making that happen. Now, there's some technologies that are generally required to try to you know make you know get to, get to our goal uh, the first one uh, which is near and dear to my heart is uh, edge computing and edge computing has gotten quite a big of play lately sure it's being defined in a number of different ways in fact I'll be showing an edge computer this small little IO module uh, as, a, as another example of how the power of processing and software and memory and robustness and a reliable you know OT system, is indeed an edge compute device. But the second thing is also critical, and this speaks to cybersecurity, it speaks to a number of different topics, but that's networking. In more, more particular is zoning, being able to create zones of networks to protect unprotected devices. And let's be honest, most of the devices on a plant floor today are unprotected, they're not secure and they're on just a regular LAN perhaps, or maybe they're on an air-gapped LAN or whatever, and then it makes it harder to get the information out. So the technology for networking and zoning becomes critical. And then the third is once the network's in place, your edge computer's in place, what are the data comms? What are the communication models, whether it's a data model, the, a data comm uh, approach, say MQTT or you know what Modbus, whatever it might be, those data comms become important as well. All right, enough of the big sky stuff, let's jump in. Uh, Groove Rio, this is what we're gonna talk about today, Groove Rio with the Ignition Edge, 200,000 IO configurations from a single device. Yes, indeed, I'll show you that in a moment, uh, but let's uh, take it from a top level. It is indeed a, an Ethernet IO module. It's designed to fit on a DIN rail, as you can see. It's multi-signal, multi-channel, multi-function IO all in one single package. It can be line powered or PoE powered, which is what I'm doing here. Uh, it's web-based and cyber secure. So all the security capabilities that we can stuff into this box are in there. A lot of accounts and encryption, more on that in the demos. Uh, it's not a real-time controller, but we do have the Node-RED runtime engine on there, so you can actually develop some simple logic to do down there or use the compute module from the Ignition Edge platform. And speaking of, of, of Ignition, that's the beauty and why we're here today is that integration of Rio with Ignition Edge running right on the device. Uh, and there's a couple different ways that can be done. There's a, a native Sparkplug B publisher that's built into the Rio, but what we want to talk about today is Ignition, uh, Ignition Edge version eight running on this guy. 
And when I say running on this guy, that means it can be pretty much running anywhere. Uh, you can see that it's UL ATX approved, a wide temperature range, class one div two even for those uh, um, environments that need it. So this is a rugged device designed to be deployed right at the edge of the network, pulling in IO data and with ignition, uh, being able to pull in other data. And that's the beauty of the Ignition Edge platform. In this case, uh, Ignition is, is pre-installed, ready to roll on this thing. Uh, you, the Edge IoT module gives you uh, three things, uh, essentially. The MQTT transmission module, which is, comes from our friends at Cirrus Link Solutions, that allows us to take all the data we're collecting and publish it up to an MQTT broker. The second is the PLC device drivers. All of them are in there. They're all part of Ignition 8. Just choose the ones you want, connect it to your PLCs, up to two devices with the base license. You can extend that if you need to. Uh, and then of course it has OPC UA server and client. So if you needed to secure an OPC server that was on an unsecure network, you could do it with a Rio, communicate to the OPC server and then uh, burp that data up securely to just about anywhere. Uh, additional modules are also supported by this, uh, this uh, instance of Ignition Edge, including Edge Panel, I'll show you how that works, but also other of the modules that are in the Ignition Edge suite, including Compute, Sync, and Enterprise Asset Module, but also the Cirrus Link modules. So you've got your uh, injectors, your cloud injectors, Azure, AWS, uh, I'm missing one, Google Cloud, I think, uh, those are there, and even some of the Cepasoft OEE modules. We've been doing a, a lot of great work with the folks at Cepasoft, both for our Epic and now uh, the Rio. Now, as I said before, and this is this is critically important, it is cyber secure out of the box. We're not talking about coding. We're not talking about command line messing with IP tables. We're, this is completely built in with a nice interface. I'm going to show you this in the live demo, but this device has encryption and user accounts, two critical pieces of security for any device that's on the plant floor, on an IT network, you name it. It's designed also to create zones. So I can, I can in this case here, let me pop over to my desk cam, my cooking cam, and as you can see, I've got an Allen Bradley processor in my Rio. I wanna create a network zone for that and another network zone that goes up to the IT network. So th that network zoning is, is very important. And then for each of those zones, I have a configurable firewall. So I can be very granular about what kind of access I permit to the device through any of those network interfaces. More on that in a moment. And then of course, any secure device has a certificate. A server certificate is uh, the primary thing, SSL, TLS. So we have certificate management tools built in as well. And then quickly about the IO. Yes, it is software configurable IO. There's eight channels of multifunction, uh, mixed IO signals, discrete, analog, voltage, temperature, resistance, whatever you need, it's all in there. You just pick the channel you wanna land your instrumentation to and software configure it, more on the demo. Plus there's two electro uh, electromechanical relays on there rated up to five amps at 300 volts that can be wired up as normally open or normally closed. This is a quick diagram. It's in all of our brochures and our uh, data sheets and so on that just shows how some of those instrumentation signals land onto the uh, terminal strip on the Rio. Uh, and that kind of gives you your configuration options uh, that are available. We also have a really uh, useful Rio Explorer tool on our website that allows you to come up with all these different configurations that can be saved, that can be sent to our engineers for review uh, and so on. So relative to the architecture of the software and the Rio itself, this is essentially how it looks. So as you can see down here, I've got my various IO signals, analog, digital, serial, uh, wired up to my terminations. I can also connect to serial devices using a USB to serial adapter. And that's what we're doing with this oil and gas box down here to talk to a Modbus serial pump off controller. So that's uh, supported as well, although not necessarily illustrated on this drawing. Then over another network interface or a given network interface, I'm gonna to communicate to perhaps unsecure PLCs. And that's what I'm gonna show you here on my desktop as well. Uh, and then over another network interface, I'll communicate up to the corporate network, in which case I'm gonna move data to on-premise applications, I'll maybe move it up to the cloud or directly to devices. But as you can see by this little padlock here, that will always be done very securely because 
we don't know who's on the corporate network, so we only want to allow authenticated access or outbound access only. So when we kind of wrap that up into system architectures, what you see on the screen now is kind of where, where we go with this. Uh, and this, uh, this is our overall system architecture, but what's uh, important to note on here is uh, you've got OT network zones where largely unsecured PLCs exist. Uh, it's kind of your air-gapped network, if you will. And then you got your IT zones. These are you know, paths to the internet or paths to other networks, whatever it is, through a valid gateway. And then you got your DMZ or cloud zone. It doesn't really matter which is which. They're essentially the same. DMZ is typically on-prem. Cloud is, well, it's in the cloud, wherever that is. Uh, and then we got another uh, IT zone here with the uh, with the SCADA platform and other zones, including like remote access uh, using VPN. So this is kind of the overall for a lot of our products, kind of that OT architecture, also showing how messages move around from MQTT messages to VPN traffic to conduits. That's all uh, topics for another webinar. Let's focus on what I'm dealing with in this demo. So here we go. Uh, we've got our OT zone here, and I'll switch my screen real quickly to show that my OT zone is here, and also this PC that's over here over my shoulder. So that PC and uh, the Allen Bradley PLC and one of the network interfaces on the Rio constitutes a zone. That's where we're going to collect data, and then we're going to provide that data to other applications over the IT zone, and in this case, this PC that's right here in the middle is the PC I'm presenting from. So it's on the IT network, but I have access to the Rio uh, and ultimately data from, uh, from sensors and, and Allen Bradley uh, PLC. Then I'm gonna move you know, data up to wherever it needs to be. I can use gateway network, I can use MQTT. I'm gonna show you examples of both. And then I'll also in this demonstration, show you our ignition gateway. So we have a full gateway running on a, vi a virtual machine here at Opto uh, that is exposed to the internet securely. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some of the configurations there of how we're getting the data to move across, okay? Uh, let me go ahead and click one more because the, there's two other Rios here in my demo studio. One, of course, is the one I just mentioned earlier, the Rio, the oil and gas box that we have down here uh, that's using a cradle point modem to get out over a network. And I've also got a Rio behind me uh, that uh, is just on a flat network. So just uh, it can work in a lot of different ways is what the bottom line is. All right, so that's gonna jump me into uh, the live demo. So what I'm gonna do first is uh, I'm gonna bring up a browser and then I'm gonna switch my screen over to here. All right, let's settle in. This is where the fun begins. What time am I doing? Oh, not bad, not bad. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna do is kind of give you a, a sense of the build out, what, uh, how an architecture like this is built out. So I've got this kind of cool little web page that one of my illustrators did for me. Uh, I thank him for that. And we start off with, you know, essentially assets in the field, uh, sensors or perhaps uh, intelligent assets like drives or whatever. And then we're gonna add on naturally PLCs if they already exist, or we can just connect those IO sensors directly to the Rio and that kind of constitutes the OT network zone. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna also from my PC configure that IT zone or the untrusted network, we don't know who's on that network, for secure only access. And that's also uh, shown here with this firewall. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we're gonna move that data on up to some applications on-prem and also the cloud all simultaneously. So the first thing we need to do is uh, log into this Rio here. See, it says called Rio ICL. Okay, that's just the, the host name I made. Uh, let's take a look at how that's done. So I'm gonna come over here to my Rio or to my bookmarks, and I'm gonna choose Rio ICL local. And you'll notice it loads up right there and it's secure. So from my PC connecting to the Rio on that uh, IT network, I am connected securely and I must authenticate. I must put in a username and password. So indeed, I'm gonna do that. And I'm not gonna just use the local password on this thing. I'm actually gonna log into this device using my, my IT credentials. Those are my credentials for getting on the Opto22 network. So I'm gonna use something called LDAP. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. Now what I've, what I've got is this little Ethernet IO module running <laughs> Ignition Edge, yet I am logging into it by authenticating to an LDAP server. 
So that looks uh, right here, I'm logged in now. I'm gonna go ahead and click on accounts and click on users. And as you can see, I have two users. The first one is this opto user, but note, there's no default user. There's no default username and password for these devices. When they ship from the factory, the first thing you need to do is commission it up, which I did over on this PC here, uh, on that OT network zone, gave it that local user, and then set up LDAP so all my other users uh, are authenticated remotely. And this becomes important, particularly in, say, a, a cybersecurity uh, scenario, in which case, let's say there's an employee that, um, I don't know, goes rogue or decides to leave the company. You know, rather than going out to every single device to, you know, wipe out his account credentials, I can now do it in one location. This is what IT does. They manage those, uh, those accounts and permissions in one place. All right, enough about accounts. Uh, let's go to the next step, which was, how did I get this thing on the network? So I'm going to go to System and Network. And here you can see I have three, essentially, three network interfaces on this little Rio. The first one is the Ethernet right here. So let me switch my screen. And you can see I've got an Ethernet cable plugged into here. It also happens to be PoE, and that's how I'm powering uh, the Rio. And that goes back into a PoE hub that's behind, or PoE switch behind me, which is also where the Allen Bradley processor is plugged in. But note, I'm using a static IP, which is, tends to be prevalent on OT network zones, a uh, non routable 172 address. Just swap your camera back, Benson. Oh, thank you. Uh, 172 address.22.30. So remember that, it'll become important later. Uh, that's the connection there. And then over here is my Wi Fi connection. So switching back, I've got my uh, USB uh, Wi Fi adapter. It's connected and connected to the corporate LAN. And in that case, I am DHCPing. So I'm getting a, obtaining an IP address directly from IT. That again is all managed by them, but it also allows me to register the domain name, which is, or the host name, which is right there. And note that that's the same address I use to access the device, all securely. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have an OpenVPN client built into the Rio, as well as the Epix. That allows me to create a connection over the gateway IT LAN to a configured OpenVPN server. Could be on-prem, could be uh, in the cloud, doesn't really matter. But that connection is a third connection that allows me, now I have three network zones on this device uh, for security. All right, that was fun. Lots of other stuff in there. Uh, what the next important part relative to security and networking I'll cover uh, is absolutely the firewall. As I mentioned earlier, each of those network interfaces can be configured to allow traffic or disallow. Very quickly, a firewall is designed to prevent outbound or incoming access to a device. We're gonna basically block everything and only allow certain traffic to come in. This is important because the only traffic we wanna to allow to come into the Rio is authenticated encrypted traffic. So indeed up on the top one here, the Groove Rio itself, while we're only allowing traffic to come in on HTTPS. Port 80 is shown there, but all traffic is redirected to 443, so it's always a secure encrypted connection. And on each of those network interfaces, I'm permitting that because it's encrypted and I have an account set up for that. But Modbus TCP, that's not a secure protocol. So I wouldn't want to allow anybody on the LAN to come and access the Modbus TCP registers, unless you trusted everybody on that LAN. But you can start to see where I'm only going to permit certain interfaces to access the Modbus server that's on this, or it's actually in this case Modbus slave, that's on this device. Same goes for all of the other things. The beauty of Ignition Edge is, uh, particularly with version 8, everything is secure. So I'm going to allow access on all the interfaces to Ignition Edge over 8043 and 8060. So again, very cool stuff in terms of, of granular access to the device, making it very secure. I can literally shut off all the ports on this thing and just do all outbound access. 100% capable of doing that as well. Now, if you have your own application, and we do have, if the keen eye will see that we have shell access, you can actually turn on uh, your shell access and write your own application and run it on the Rio if you, if you choose. Um, and uh, in that case, you would add a rule for that. And you know, if you had to have a listener or something in your application. All right, 
before we get to ignition, I think you probably want to see the I/O channels. This is really cool. I mean, you're talking about a, a single a one part number that you can literally put on the shelf, and as you need to get a little bit of data, you pull it off the shelf and you put it in because you can software define the, those I/O channels, and that's what we've done here. So on my screen, I've got a top button, bottom button, fuel level by this little knob here, a temperature, a little LED. Uh, it's all there and I can see everything as I turn things on or off. As I turn my uh, potentiometer, I'm changing my fuel level as indicated here. Uh, let's take a quick look at how that's configured. So I'm gonna click into the top button here. And here you can see I've got uh, more status. I've even got some latching on going on there. I'm gonna click on the configure button over here. There we go. And here it is, just fill out a form. Give it a name, and in this case, in many cases, this name becomes the single source of truth. You know, particularly in an MQTT uh, environment where I'm creating a unified namespace, topic namespace, uh, that can become the single source of truth. And then here's where the magic really happens. When I click this channel type, all of these channels are supported. So you literally just pick what sensor or what transducer or what circuit you're plugged into on channel zero, and that channel becomes that device. There's a lot of other uh, cool capabilities in here outside of the scope of this webinar. We're focused mostly on the Ignition Edge on this Rio, but like I said, you get eight channels of configurable uh, uh, software configurable I/O, and then you've also got two um, uh, mechanical relays down there that can be configured as normally open or normally closed. Terrific, let's move on. Ignition, the moment we've all been waiting for. Completely integrated, completely built in. So as you can see from this screen, I can now, uh, I've got the different ignition platforms that are available for the Rio, both ignition, full ignition if you, if you wish, uh, or ignition edge, which we're gonna focus on here. I can see it's running uh, and the version that's running. I've even got a hyperlink here to go ahead and launch into the gateway. So let's take a look at this gateway. All right, here we go. Uh, first things first, let's go to the status page. And as soon as I do that, naturally it's gonna ask me to log in. Now the commissioning process for the Edge uh, is the same as you would expect if you downloaded Ignition Edge from the website. Uh, you'll have to create a user account, you'll have to accept the terms of the license, all that's built in right through this interface. So once you've done that, I can go ahead and create uh, or log in with my account credentials. There we go. And we'll come up to the status page. A couple of quick things I wanna show you on the status page. Uh, we got it to, you know, when I'm hitting it hard with a web server, my CPU goes up a little bit, but in general, everything's looking pretty good. Uh, one of the things I wanna show you, we are indeed running on a Linux ARM. The Rio is a uh, Linux device uh, ARM uh, processor. And just as I described earlier, the Ignition Edge can see all of my network interfaces. That's important because that means Ignition Edge running here on the Rio can communicate to the Allen Bradley PLC on one network interface, can connect to MQTT servers, VPN servers, and so on over the LAN interface, and then also accept VPN traffic over the final uh, VPN interface. So very cool there. Uh, let's go to devices, because uh, that's where that's the cool part about Ignition Edge is it's gonna give me an opportunity to connect to other systems. So not just to the IO on the Rio, but to other systems as well. So you can see there, I've got a configured um, L24 processor here on the uh, Allen Bradley, and I'm also communicating to the Rio. In this case, Modbus, yes, uh, Rio supports Modbus as well. I'm gonna go to the configuration page because I'm gonna show you essentially how those devices are created. And a lot of you on the call are Ignition users, so you're probably very aware of how the, uh, the drivers work in Ignition. They work very similarly on Ignition Edge. I'm gonna click Edit here. I'm gonna come to the page for the Allen Bradley driver. And you know, what's cool is the Allen Bradley driver by Ignition is, is magical. I mean, I literally put in the IP address of the PLC, and that's it. I hit save, it pulls all the tags in and boom, I can start building my application. So in this case, the Allen Bradley PLC is at uh, on that private network at dot 52. All right, keep a track of my uh, my screens here, so I'm, uh, or my uh, steps. Okay, next thing is, how do we get the data from the Allen Bradley PLC, the IO to other applications? First one, 
Gateway Network. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Gateway Network. Indeed, that's supported here as well. In fact, it's included on the IIoT uh, Edge module license. So indeed, I come over here, I can uh, see that it's enabled, and then I'm gonna go over here to incoming connections, and I'm permitting a secure incoming connection over the gateway network from another system. In this case, my main gateway that's running here at Opto22. So there you have it. Gateway network is set up. I'll show it to you over on the main gateway in a moment. But before we get there, one other thing I wanna show you is MQTT. So I have the MQTT transmission module installed on this device. I'm gonna come down here to settings. And the idea behind MQTT is to be able to take all those tags that I have now in the Rio and publish those tags to a broker. And that could be on premise, it could be in the cloud, it can be wherever. And in this case, I am doing one, I'm, the broker I've selected is from our friends uh, at Cirrus Link Solutions, the Chariot broker running on an Amazon EC2 instance but I can put multiple brokers in here. I can do all kinds of different things. So there is my broker. Indeed, I'm communicating outbound to a secure broker. Uh, in this case, uh, it's called chariot.groove.com. And then once the broker, or the server connection is created, I create what are called transmitters. The transmitters are the way I transmit information on a given spark plug ID. It's all there. Okay. Very, very cool. The next step, of course, is to let's, let's look at... Uh, designer. So for it to you know, make things a little simpler, I've kind of already launched the designer, but you just use the uh, designer launcher, launch your designer. It's launching uh, securely, in this case, from the uh, IT network. And there's all my tags. So I've got my Alan Bradley tags here. Let's take a look. If I press this start button, that's that green momentary there. So as soon as I press it, uh, bingo, there it comes on. Terrific. Uh, and then over here on the Rio, I've got this blue LED, which is currently showing on. So I'm gonna check the box, make sure I enable read write, and the LED goes off. So clearly I've got a connection between my designer running on the edge to the IO and the Elm Rally PLC, all 100% secure, very cool. And then of course, once I have my IO, I just drag it out here to a canvas and there you go. I can uh, go ahead and turn on the blue LED from. Uh, from my canvas, there you saw the LED come on uh, right there. Let's do it again and off, pretty cool. Uh, same thing with my potentiometer here uh, and even my, uh, I can turn on a um, alarm output and this light will come on on the PLC as you just saw, on or off. Everything's working, terrific. Let's actually show it to you in a browser because yes, if I go to a new tab and come over to Rio, and go to, uh, let's see, Ignition Edge Panel. There you go. With the panel license, I can now, from the IT network or the OT network, I can access my screens. Obviously, if I have the right credentials. For simplicity, I made this uh, you know, pretty much accessible to anybody, but I still am secure. So I'm already logged in, and I can log in and see the data. Pretty cool. So now I've got a little HMI right on an IO module as well. Uh, communicating to all these systems. Okay, enough about Edge. Let's move up to the big gateway. Let's move up to the main gateway. Um, and here, I'll go ahead and launch that uh, here in a browser. There we go. And just to recap, I'll go back to my screen and add the next level. Now I'm using full ignition, and I'm gonna uh, be able to see the data coming from the remote tag provider on the Rio uh, and uh, various other things. So there it is, there's my system. I can go into the status page. This is just running on a uh, VM here at, uh, at Opto22, again, a public one. Uh, I can see all the information there, including the public IP address uh, to, out to the internet. So we have a lot of demos that use this gateway. I've also launched the Ignition Designer for this gateway. And normally it'll come up to the default provider here, but in this case, I wanna show you two things. One, Rio ICL Edge. This, of course, is your gateway network. So now I'm getting all the tags into the main gateway from the remote tag provider in the remote gateway, which is nice because now I can build my screens here and if I have EAM, I can deploy them down to the Rios. I have a lot of capabilities for a distributed system uh, using this technology. So there it all is. 
And then I just built a very quick screen um, showing the difference between the gateway network and the MQTT spark plug B, because yes, on this ignition gateway, I also have MQTT engine. Now what engine does is, uh, let me switch back to my topo screen here. What engine does is um, uh, ignition edge engine, right? Let's, let's see if I can get my uh, key out there. There we go. The MQTT engine module runs right here on the ignition gateway that I'm working on at this moment and goes up to the MQTT broker and pulls all the tags from all systems that are publishing, which is great because now I've got a main gateway that can see everything. So if I go back, see everything is exactly right. Let me go now to the MQTT engine tag provider right there, go to edge nodes and demo centers. I'm talking about this demo center in front of me and epic demo centers behind me. They're all over the world and a lot of them are publishing into the same broker. So I can actually see all the demo centers that are online right now. Uh, I can come down here to Opto22 and I've even got uh, my house in here. It turns out I can get Epics at a pretty good price. So I put one in, uh, in my house and I'm publishing in and pulling it into this ignition gateway, mixing it with all the other data, democratization of operational data right here in ignition. So that's kind of cool. But uh, this isn't about my house, this is about the demos. So let me go down to here and there indeed is Rio ICL. There's my Allen Bradley processor. There is my Rio IO all through MQTT. That's how I was able to build this screen with both gateway network information and Sparkplug B. And as you can see, they all work very quickly. Now remember, MQTT is going outbound from the Rio over the IT network up to the broker on AWS. And then the gateway, the main gateway, is subscribing to all that data and allowing me to build these screens. So there's a lot of things I can do here. Uh, it does, doesn't really matter which one I use, but let me pull this. Uh, that's what I meant to do is pull that in and click alarm output. That'll turn on this output down here. So very cool. So once I have the data in the broker, I can do a lot with it with ignition, but hey, well, what about some other things we can do? Well, here's another example. I'm gonna come down here to this one, which is the Rio oil and gas box. This, this uh, PLC, that's actually this Rio down here in this oil and gas, art, it's essentially an RTU as I described earlier. This one is also publishing its data. So I can actually see that right into this screen here. There's my oil and gas data, uh, temperatures, flows, well heat, uh, wellhead temperature, uh, whether the pump jack is moving or not, all kinds of information. And then once we connect this to the pump off controller, we're gonna pull in all the pump off cards. All of those come through the ignition system all over MQTT, all securely, pretty slick. So now that we got all the data in the broker, perhaps some of it's in ignition, what else can we do with it? Well, let's take a look at my browser again. And I am going to log in to our friends over at Canary Labs have an historian. And of course, you know, the historian works beautifully with the ignition uh, ignition gateway, you know, direct implementation, pull all the tags, historize them and so on. But Canary's also written a, a MQTT spark plug, basically engine or a client to go get the tags from the broker and bring them in. Let's see what that looks like. So here we are in Axiom, which is their web-based interface uh, to, the, uh, to the Canary data. And let's go to here. Let's go to five minutes and apply. There it is. So you saw as I was moving, um, actually let me come out to about, let's say uh, 10 minutes and apply. And you'll see where I actually move some of the, my other, I press some of the buttons, I can see my waveform. All this is historized on this a Canary Lab server, but the way it got its data is from the broker. So if I come back to my overview screen and I add in some of my final layers here, I can see I have a lot of data publishing into the system right up to the MQTT broker and having other applications subscribe to that. Very, very slick. Um, and of course, there's others in here as well. Uh, I can't uh, help myself. I'm also bringing all the power that uh, my home is using right now. And there you see it. So <laughs> pretty, 
pretty slick stuff. So my pull pump is on right now, so I can see that coming in. So the bottom line is democratization of data, doing it securely, doing it at very high performance uh, in a lot of different ways. We're at 940. One other thing I'm gonna show you. I've been talking about, especially in today's world, we have an issue, go ahead, somebody? No, you're good, sorry, I'll... Got all it. good. One of the things that we've all been faced with over these past 16, 17 months, however long it's been, is remote access. How do we gain access to our devices when we're sitting at home? And that's the beauty of VPN. And, and that's what I'm gonna show you next. I'm gonna actually, uh, I'll close this screen. Um, go ahead and close this guy down. What I wanna show you is from this screen here, I'm gonna actually open up a basically a, a what's called any desk session to my computer at home, okay? So I'm gonna actually log into the computer at home so I can see the screen and show it to you. Because what I'm gonna illustrate is that this Rio does have that open VPN connection. So from the Rio here, I'm connecting into the, in this case, the cloud, connecting to a VPN server and keeping that connection open. But I can, you know, obviously turn it on and off based on need, and that's what we recommend, do it on demand. Then my, my PC at home, here is my remote access PC. So let's get that going. Um, I'm gonna open it up here and let's come to there. Now on your screen, you're seeing um, the NADS software running on my local computer. And I'm gonna go into uh, this PC here. Now I've turned off, um, I've turned off the two-factor authentication for both my PC and for the OpenVPN server, just to make it simpler. Both offer two-factor authentication, highly recommended. We know that the uh, application, the cyber incident in, uh, incident in Florida was caused largely by an exposed VPN password. Absolutely use two-factor authentication. I would do the same for your ignition instances as well. Um, they have, uh, Inductive's done a terrific job of, of, of the identity piece and the two-factor authentication in there as well. Okay, uh, this is my uh, my application at home. Turns out, like I said, I've got a lot of automation at home. I'm gonna open up a new tab here and I'm gonna go to my VPN connector. So right now I'm not connected to the VPN. There's no way from, you know, to the VPN server. So now I'm gonna come up here, I'm gonna select this guy and I'll wait for him to get in. I just tested it before we got going. So it uh, I haven't timed out for my user credentials, but normally I'd have to enter user credentials and my two-factor authentication, but I'm connected. Now what I'm gonna do is I've created a hyperlink right down here called Rio IC. I know it's hard for you to see. It's uh, very small on my screen too. Go right to there and look at that. I'm logged in to this Rio from my house. Sign in. And just to prove I'm not uh, joking around, <laughs> I'm gonna go to system, network, and there you go. I've got the highlighted ICL there. This is all, it's, just, it's the same Rio, but I'm now I'm doing it from home. So that VPN access on all our devices, again, provides a very secure method of creating a connection from the devices into a VPN server. And then again, another client coming in and creating a tunneled, secured encrypted connection to your devices. No need, no need to open up ports on plant floor devices and expose them to anyone. With something as uh, affordable as a Rio or even our Epics, you can front end all of those unsecured devices, provide a lot of capabilities for remote access, for moving data around at very high performance uh, with a lot of flexibility. I think it's a great time for uh, Q and A. Who's in? Uh, Benson, um, Garrick, and I have been going like crazy. Um, wow. There's yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of great questions. Um, the, the, the general sort of thrust seems to be just understanding the ability to be able to put more, uh, more access to your PLCs, legacy PLCs behind Epic or Rio. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that's, that sort of seems to be the thrust of a lot of the questions is communication options and uh, one of the questions was what happens if the communication goes down? Maybe you wanna talk mm -hmm. about um, store and forward just a little bit and some of the cool stuff that Ignition's doing there. 
Great, uh, great question. Uh, yeah, that's that's a key consideration. Uh, so if I do go back over here to my um, my browser, I'll just pull it up here for a moment. Uh, indeed, we can't always expect that a connection, say, on the IT network or even a cellular network will always be on. Uh, and so that's another power of edge computing with the right software. And of course, the right software is Ignition Edge, is its ability to store that data um, on the edge until uh, communications resume. So whether it's cellular, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's VPN, whatever, if that connection to say the broker, in the case of MQTT is lost, the MQTT transmission module will automatically start storing that data at the edge. And then when the communications are reestablished to the broker, again in the MQTT scenario, then all that data gets burped up. First, the real-time values come in, and then MQT transmission starts sending all the historical data right behind it. The beauty is, when those uh, tags are set up as historical, they'll all get backfilled right into your historical database. So that's a very, very cool feature, particularly in remote assets like this oil and gas box I have down here. Gateway network, same kind of thing. One week buffer of data in there in the event of a gateway failure, uh, we can store data. Um, again, Edge doesn't have a database. Uh, it has its own little database for storing data and so on, but it's not a full ignition uh, system, so it's not set up with a database. If you want to do that, you can. You can actually install a database right on the Rio and on Epic uh, for those of you that are brave enough to do so. Brave in the sense that you know how to do it. Uh, we give you a lot of access with shell and tools and so on to do so. Hopefully that answered the question, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Benson, we're, we're going pretty good on time but one of the questions actually leads into uh i, I don't want to steal the fun but um uh, one question was i may have missed this but can we access the ab logics plc behind the rio so uh -huh. uh, i'm sure you're going to get to that one in just a moment here um well, yeah and you're right we are doing pretty good on time but uh i'll just pop this thing up here uh indeed we can uh with rio which is uh, so right down Go ahead, Ben. We're looking at your architecture uh, in the browser yeah, at the I'll moment. Change, I'll change okay. it in a moment. Thank Great. you. Um, so here's my uh, my Rio, and yes, you, indeed, I'm showing you the architecture, which I'm going to pull up on another screen here in a moment. In fact, I go ahead and do that uh, here. Um, the question is, uh, looking at this architecture, can I access this PLC on a private network from, say, the VPN interface? coming through the Rio? The answer is soon <laughs> on Rio, but over here, I am doing that. So I'm kind of set up for it, but uh, let me just close this guy down here if you guys want to see it. If you really want to see it, I'm happy to show it to you. Uh, or call us up, Garrick, Ben, any one of us can show it to you. But here's what happens. I'm going to show, I'm going to switch this screen back over. Um, Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint and just page up to this screen here so I can show you how this works. So I've got my mouse pointer here. The way it works is this way. Inside this epic here, and this is where this thing called port redirects currently exists that allows me to redirect ports between interfaces so you can do this and you can do it securely. For example, um, in my uh, PLCs, Right here, I've got two PLCs on a private network, same as I've done over here, connected to an Epic on one network interface. On the second network interface is going to my corporate LAN. Okay, so that's the untrusted network, corporate LAN, whatever. And that's also my path to the internet, to MQTT servers, to open VPN servers, and so on. Now I have a control program running here. It's operating this turbine. I've got local HDMI. That's all, that's all in there as well. But what's important is that I have segmented or zoned these unsecure PLCs from the corporate LAN and from anywhere else. Now, what I can do is I can go back in through my interface here uh, on the, on the uh, Epic, and I can create what are called conduits. And the way that it works is this way. The Epic itself is set up to connect to a VPN server. And then on my remote P PLs or my remote workstation here at home, I log into that VPN server. Now I've created a secure encrypted connection directly to the Epic. However, 
because the PLCs are on their own network zone, how do I access those? This new service that's built in, and I'll go ahead and uh, take a little bit of a risk here, but not a big risk. I'm gonna log in and show you where that's done. I'm gonna log right into the uh, Epic. So this is the Epic behind me. And if I go to system, port forward, this is where it's done. So I'm uh, literally taking uh, traffic that's coming in on the tunnel, on the VPN tunnel, and I'm moving it to the private network on the port that needs to listen there, which is on ETH0, one of the Ethernet ports on the Epic. Now, right now this is enabled, but what we recommend is that you only enable it when you need it. Now, I'm showing you how to enable and disable and where it's configured all from the gateway. I'm, I'm sorry, for all from Groove Manage running on the Epic. But wow, wouldn't it be cool to do this directly from Ignition? I'll save that for a moment. I'll save that for a moment uh, a little bit later. So long story short, uh, coming back to here, that's what these red, uh, these red lines here that are indicated, these are your conduits or your port forwards to your PLCs. This is your VPN access to the Epic in the first place. Now I would simply run, say, RS links or whatever software on this PC. And yes, I can get all the way to the PLCs on the secure zone. Here's what's important. It's all encrypted. It's all, it's actually double authenticated because first you got to have the VPN tunnel, then you got to have the uh, access over on the uh, Epic side. You know, it's just, it's, it's the most secure way you can do this. And we're not having to use third party tools. We're just using what's built in to the Epic, and soon the same feature will be on the real. Long-winded answer, but there you go. If you hang around to the end, I'll show you something very cool relative to this uh, uh, this this uh, capability from Ignition. Next question. Um, another question, Benson. Perhaps you can. Um, we, we've answered it, but I'd just like you to flesh out a little bit, um, and maybe it'll help describe some of the relationship that Opto has with inductive. But the question was, when Inductive release a new version of Ignition, do we have to mm -hmm. update the firmware in the Rio? We do. Um, the way that we do this is uh, if, when a new release of Ignition Edge or full Ignition, uh, we get a new installer, and then we put that onto our system, put it into the QA process, well, actually into the build process. Uh, and then it's got to go through QA, make sure all the pieces work together, uh, and then it's released. So under the current uh, uh, upgrade, scenario that is indeed how we get the latest version of ignition edge or ignition on our devices and that's why you may see you know a lag by the time it's available from ignition we have to run it through all of our processes to get it onto the uh, firmware fully tested through our qa department uh, and then it comes out as release but the short answer is yes uh, upgrades to ignition are done through epic or rio firmware upgrades Awesome stuff. Benson, I think you've got time for maybe one more thing. Okay, I'll throw it out there. Um, we've been working, you know, one of the cool things about the port redirect, the, you know, the conduiting, uh, and also this network zoning is uh, it's really capable. There's a lot of capabilities. And as I was just showing you, I go in through Groove Manage and I can set all these up. I can fire up my VPN. I can fire up my port redirects. But maybe you don't always want to go through Groove Manage. What if you could do this from a single pane of glass? What if you could do this from Ignition? So we have worked with, uh, oh, and I'll get the, I'll pass the helm back to you in a moment, Kent, for uh, closing thoughts. So here's my one more thing. I just always wanted to do this. So here it is. Uh, the Groove Ignition module by Avidyne. Avidyne is a system integrator up in Bakersfield, California. And they're working with a large customer there. Um, I can't name them. Uh, but in any case, they're working with them to incorporate this to start securing field assets. Uh, and this, this was the problem. Uh, we wanted to be able to do this. Hooray, we can now do it. We can now secure devices in the field uh, and, and address cybersecurity issues. However, can we do it from Ignition? So we started working with uh, Avidyne and, uh, and with our own development team and this is what is created. It's not yet available. It soon will be. This is kind of beta, but what you can see here, and I think I saw my laser pointer going, I've got Opto 22 Groove down here. 
with general network and port forward rules. This allows me to do essentially ISA 62443 zoning and conduits from ignition. And the way it does it is our Epics and Rios have a full RESTful API. So anything I can do in Groove Manage, I can do through an API. And that's what Abidine is taking uh, advantage of. They pulled in our entire Swagger document for our, all of our API calls and have built a gateway interface to turn, uh, turn these uh, configurations on and off to actually enable and disable the VPN. And all of these tags are over in its own tag provider. So think about that. I can drag these tags onto the canvas and allow somebody to turn on or off the VPN access at, based on their uh, credentials, uh, on their view uh, perspective or vision credentials. Uh, I can also got some advanced properties. I can set up all the port forwards right here and turn them on and off on demand. And this is critical because you don't necessarily want to leave a VPN open all the time. You may not even want to leave, well, you definitely don't want to leave port redirects uh, open all the time. You only want them when you have to make a program change or you need to get into the PLC for some reason. So for, that's how this thing is built. It's designed to give you on demand, secure. And remember, if you're doing this through Ignition, all of that is audited. You know who, you know when, you know for how long. And there's also some other features in there that are built in that are kind of cool where they'll actually time out over time. So, you know, if you say you can only allow access for five minutes and somebody forgets to shut it all off, it'll automatically do it. So we're super excited about working with Avidyne, terrific development team over there. Uh, again, I think this shows the power of the Ignition community to extend the platform to address the kinds of concerns that we're dealing with today. Uh, and that's, that's amazing. So keep your eye out, look for our blog or uh, Ignition or Avidine's blog where we uh, you know, naturally will announce this. We also anticipate having a full uh, a webinar that just focuses on this feature, on these capabilities for securing your existing legacy assets, democratizing their data, doing this at high performance, and achieving your business goals, your business outcomes. And if it happens to be cybersecurity or just getting data around, we can help you with both. So with that, I'm going to, uh, let's page up to here. I think there's one other announcement that uh, Kent would like to say. Yeah, thanks so much, Benson. Uh, incredible presentation. It's fun to see all this stuff uh, in action uh, coming together. And uh, I'm glad that you uh, ended with Avidine's module there. Um, it kind of leads into what I wanted to talk about, which is ICC. Maybe that doesn't seem like a direct lead in. I'll explain that in a second. But we have our Ignition Community Conference every year. Last year and this year has been a virtual event, um, you know, being cautious with uh, COVID-19. Being virtual, it's free. So you have no excuse. You got to come. You got to join us. It's going to be exciting. Um, there's going to be a keynote, developer panel, all the stuff you're used to. But one thing that we didn't have last year that people got really mad and they said, you got to bring this back was the Build-A-Thon. If you haven't uh, watched a Build-A-Thon in the past, you're missing out. The past Build-A-Thons are available on our website. So feel free to check those out. Um, but it's been Travis and Kevin going head to head, building cool things for Ignition. Um, the reason I say it's great that you talked about how the integrators in our community are doing exciting things with Ignition. Well, that leads in this because this year, instead of Travis and Kevin directly going head to head for the Build-A-Thon, they've gone into our, our integrators and they have actually recruited teams to go against each other. And so uh, stay tuned uh, to, you know, Inductive Automation's marketing because we're going to be announcing uh, those teams and we're going to talk about uh, the challenge, what they're going to build. But this year is going to be uh, bigger and better than ever. And that will be live streamed as part of uh, ICC this year. So that's my spiel. I hope you all uh, attend ICC. And uh, really, that is it. And I really want to to thank Benson, Ben and Garrick for uh, this presentation today. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much.